Hey, good evening. My name's Dan. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at HTBB. Um, this evening, I want to speak to you about obedience because Jesus invites each and every one of us to obey him. Now, obedience tends not to inspire that much enthusiasm, partly because I think people associate it with uh, dog training or being scolded at school. But the obedience that Jesus invites us into is radically different from any kind of obedience that you encounter in any other sphere. And part of the reason that it's so different is because the defining characteristic of the obedience Jesus invites us into is joy. In fact, in the Bible, wherever you see obedience, it's nearly always followed up by an overflow, an outpouring of joy. Uh, in fact, joy and obedience are so interconnected that in the book of Deuteronomy, God says to his people, look, 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 if you obey me, but you obey me without joy, then you'll get, you'll get prosperous, but your enemies will still overtake you. Which is an incredible uh, insight, isn't it? Because we, we, all, we all get that, that you can get what you want, but if you haven't got gratitude that leads to joy, you still end up unfulfilled. Jesus says, basically, look, you can't think you're obeying me whilst being grumpy and think that that's the obedience that I'm looking for. Uh, the, so what we're going to look at today, uh, this evening, is the joy of being obedient. Uh, you've heard of FOMO, uh, the fear of missing out, and its counterpart, phobie, the introvert's fear of being invited. Uh, well, this is Jobo, the joy of being obedient. I've coined this phrase. We're going to see if we can get it, something good to go viral in this new season. And uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going, to, we're going to hold our understanding of obedience in our hands. And we're going to ask, does it spark joy? Because if it doesn't, we're going to throw it out and we're going to receive something new. Because what Jesus says for us in our reading tonight is that he's saved the best till now. So, let's have a look at it. This is John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Um, and uh, it's titled, which is kind of a spoiler alert, Jesus changes water into wine. So, we read this. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Now, I'm just going to pause there for a moment because you could be tempted to think, oh, that's like a minor inconvenience, but no problem. Like you just send somebody out to get some more wine, party carries on. But, but this isn't just a minor inconvenience. This is an absolute disaster. This is a multi-level fail. First of all, it's a hospitality fail. Hospitality in that time was like a, a primary virtue. So to invite people to your wedding and then fail to provide them would have brought shame, just not on the couple, but but also the entire family and maybe even the village. It's, it's a social fail. It's also a, a safety fail because you've got people traveling in across the desert. It's a hot climate. They're going to need to quench their thirst. But the way you purify drinking water in those days was to add a little bit of wine to it. So this is a health and safety fail as well. The groom here is putting uh, people's lives at risk. But it's also a symbolic fail because wine in the Bible symbolizes joy. And so to run out of wine before your wedding ceremony is even over is sort of like a sign that like the joy in this relationship isn't going to last and people would have probably been gossiping before the day was even over. It's a multi-level fail. It's basically a first century fire festival, okay? A first century fire festival, absolute disaster. And so Mary, knowing that, comes to Jesus and says they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So he filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside, and he said, 
everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana in Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Amen. Obedience produces joy because as you obey Jesus, you discover he loves you, you discover he has abundance for you, and you discover that he wants you to know him. This is what that verse 11 meant at the end. What Jesus did here in Cana in Galilee was the first of the signs. In other words, this isn't just a nice miracle, although it is, but it's a sign that points to something. What does it point to? It points to his glory. In other words, it points to what Jesus is like. And we read his disciples put their faith in him. And that's what the Spirit wants for us today as we read this story, that he gives us this sign, and the sign is wine, which is fun, right? It's a fun sign, and it reveals the joy of being obedient. But how do we receive this joy? Well, it's been said that obedience is not always easy, but it is often fairly simple. And I think it's summed up best in Mary's words to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Mary is an amazing model of leadership. And what we see, the first thing I want to draw attention to in that verse is that we are invited to obey a person. We're invited to obey a person. Mary is this amazing model of leadership because she sees this disaster and she doesn't pass comment on it. She doesn't pass judgment on it. You'll remember, Mary knows what it's like to have society's shame put on her. She wouldn't want it wished upon anyone else. And so instead of being a bystander, she takes ownership for it and she brings it to Jesus. We read, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. It's a picture of leadership, but it's also a picture of prayer. You encounter a problem, you bring it to Jesus, you call it out for what it is. And she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And what you see in all of that, the focus of obedience is on him. It's do whatever he tells you. Why does Mary say that? Because she believes that Jesus is who he's revealed himself to be, that he is the Son of God. Actually, on a side note, possibly one of the most convincing proofs for the divinity of Jesus is that his mum believed that he was divine. I mean, like, mums know their sons, right? Like, I'm, I'm uh, 33, I'm a father of two, I'm theologically educated, I'm ordained by the Anglican Church, but my mother, it would never even cross her mind to say those words of me to you. Do whatever he tells you. No, she loves me. She even likes me. But she knows me. Mums know their sons. And she knows that he is who he says he's, he's uh, going to reveal himself to be. And so she doesn't focus. Like Her focus, she doesn't point to the law. She doesn't point to herself. She doesn't point to best practice. She points at him. This is the first part of our obedience that brings joy. Like in any other system of thought, say like Aristotle or Confucianism or Marie Kondoism or, uh, or any kind of ism, that any other system of thought, our obedience is to a principle. But we are invited to obey a person. We're invited to obey a person. And that's a very different thing. It's not that obedience to principles is always bad. Like, principles can be great. I mean, we love a good principle. Like, uh, Instagram is basically built for it. There's a coffee shop near here that when you go and buy your drink, they write a little, like, a little life proverb. They put a little wisdoms on the the lid for you. I got this one the other day. Uh, You look at your cup and it says, focus on the good. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's that's quite good. That's a good little idea, really. That, That works. But then the other day, it was this. Hard time teach you valuable lesson. And I was like, leave it out. Like, I'm having a hard day. Like, I'll give you a valuable lesson. Like, the problem with principles is they have no power to help you. Like, when you're doing well, they're encouraging. But when you're doing bad, they condemn you. Obedience, the, the obedience that we are invited into is more like the obedience of Coach Monica. Coach Monica. Anyone else here watching Cheer? 
Yeah, a few of us. Like for those of us who, who are, uh, have more self-control on Netflix, Cheer is a, a documentary about... Um, the Navarro State College cheerleading team. And under the leadership of Coach Monica, uh, the lady here, she has led them to 14 times uh, national champions. Uh, and the show is about cheerleading, but really it's, it's more about how Coach Monica coaches. Because the team, the, they're not a, a, a team of natural winners, if we're honest. Mostly they're the last, the lost, the lonely, and some of them aren't even that fit. Uh, but yeah, she gives them really high standards and she expects the best but most of all she never gives up on them and what you see is these kids under a mix of law and grace thrive she gives them this goal of beauty and excellence but also a safety net of protective grace and love and these kids what you see is they give everything they give everything and they make these amazing cheer achievements not because they have to obey but because they know they are beloved and for love. They know they are beloved and for love. It grounds them, it motivates them, it inspires them. And obedience to Jesus is a bit like obedience to Coach Monica or to any kind of coaching relationship. He knows you. He's with you. He will never give up on you. And, even, and also importantly, he models it for us. See, we are invited to obey a person who is himself obedient. In that verse 4, uh, we read this, it, uh, Mary comes to him and, and she says, will you do this? And he says, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. There he's referring to his mission. This is his hour. This is what his father has sent him to do. But he doesn't do just what he thinks is best. Later on, he says, I only do what I see my father doing. In other words, we're invited to obey someone who is himself obedient. And that's such good news because it means he knows what it's like. In that verse 4, what you see there is he knows what it's like when your obedience to your heavenly father seems to be in conflict with obedience to your earthly family. He's navigated that himself. And if he's navigated it, and if he wants to coach you, you can be sure that he can guide you. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. That's part of the reason why we champion reading the Bible so much, especially doing the Bible in one year, because this is what he tells you. This is his words to you. And as you read this, you, you will see some good principles, but more importantly, you will encounter a person, a person who loves you, a person who wants to guide you, and most of all, a person who is intimately involved with every detail of your life. Well, you might be thinking there, well, that's great, but there's other people who want me to obey them, who want to guide me. Why should I trust Jesus? And I think the second thing that Mary uh, highlights for us in that simple verse is that Mary would say, look, the proof's in the pudding. Like, do whatever. Do whatever he tells you. Because when you obey him, what you get is always greater than what you give. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had Sandy and Annette Miller with us. Sandy and Annette are in their 80s now, but uh, they used to lead HDB Church, the church that we were planted out of in London. And they're now retired, and they live in this very small little village uh, in England. And they felt, as they uh, were making friends, that the Lord was asking them to run an Alpha course in their home for their village. And so they invited their friends. They put a poster up in the post office. They put some invites through doors. And come night one of Alpha, one man came. Just one guest. And, and so they said, well, okay, Lord, this is who you brought to us, so we'll, we'll look after him. And so every week they had him over for dinner, they watched the films, and then they uh, had the discussion. And over those 10 weeks, he came to faith in Jesus, which is wonderful. But that was a little while ago, and we just heard that the Lord didn't stop there. That guy had such a wonderful time that he, uh, he told his son about Alpha. And his son, it turns out, is a headmaster of a school in a rural part of India. And he was so encouraged by this, he's decided to start running Alpha in his school. Uh, this week, one of the Alpha Asia Pacific team is taking the four-hour journey up into the mountains to go and give them some training. Like, what can Sandy Annette and Annette do to share the good news of Jesus in Tamil Nadu, in India, in their own strength? 
not very much. But when you're obedient to Jesus, who knows? He takes what we give and he multiplies it. He turns our water into wine and that produces joy. See, look, this is the ask. This is the ask that Jesus gives us, the servants. He says, fill the jars with water. That's a little bit of effort. And then he says, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. That's a small step of faith. Take it to your boss. Hope he doesn't tell you off. Uh, A little bit of effort, a little bit of faith. Now, the thing is, there's a barrier to both of those. But this story shows us that there needn't be. I think part of the barrier is that deep down, secretly or not so secretly, we have this fear that God is a spoil sport and that he doesn't really have our best interests at heart. And actually, he doesn't want to give us good things. If anything, he wants to water down our lives. But the thing is, that is not what we see in this story. Like, first of all, we see that what we have to begin with, it's not so great. Like, it's not so great. In verse 6, he says, go and fill these water jars. And nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. These jars were used for washing. And therefore, drinking out of things used for washing, that's a little bit odd. I mean, I don't know if you saw the story this week. A a restaurant in America had to fire its staff after one of them took a bath in the industrial-sized sink. It's just not that hygienic. It's a bit weird, isn't it? But it's not, it's fill fill this thing, but also it's fill it with water. And like, think less Evian and think more Klang River. Like, that's why they needed the wine, because the water's not hygienic, so you have to purify it. Like, Jesus takes unhygienic containers he takes unpure water and he turns it into wine and it's not just a bit this is 20 to 30 gallons that's 151 regular bottles of wine times six that's 5436 glasses of wine at a traditional four ounce pour and it's not just the quantity it's the quality this is not just wine this is the best wine that the master has ever tasted so this isn't just so joy this is economic joy there is so much wine at this wedding I don't care how many times they shout yeah I'm they would not have got through all of that wine there'd have been so much left over that it had turned Galilee into the Napa Valley of the Middle East for the next few months like I did the maths on this like If, like me, you're not actually that cultured when it comes to this, you know, when the waiter says, what are you looking for, sir? Your honest answer is, cheapest bottle of red. Like, if if you're like me, then the mass of this works out at still at 45,000 ringgit. Like, that's a lot of money. But this is the best wine the master of the banquet has ever tasted. He's probably looking for Chateau Lafitte, 45 BC. And uh, (laughs) so that's a very expensive bottle of wine. Like... If you do the maths on that, it works out 3.5 million ringgit, four times the average house price of a flat in KL. Like Jesus took what they had, not that much, and he turned it into joy. Jesus is not going to water down your life. He's going to take the little you've got and he's going to multiply. And the good news is he doesn't say, he doesn't ask you to bring anything except what you've already got. Like I don't need, know what you need him to transform. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your emotions. But he doesn't say bring the best. He just says bring what you've got. And it's the moment that you need it most is the moment when he's most willing to provide it. It's precisely in that moment where you say, I have no more wine. I have no more wine. That's the moment when you can expect God to provide the most. I I don't know what it is. Maybe you've got an impasse between you and your spouse. Maybe it's that loneliness creeps up to your door. Maybe you just can't shift the needle on a situation that you're facing. But it's precisely in that moment where you say, I have no more wine, that we can know that Jesus is present and willing to guide you in obedience so you can receive everything that he has for you. Now, the great irony of this story is that running out of wine was the best thing ever to happen to this couple. It was the best thing ever to happen to them. Not because of their mistake, but because of Jesus' presence. And Jesus is present here today. 
What do you need him to transform? Because when he is present, dead things come back to life. Water turns into wine. The resurrection of Jesus means that there is no area of your life that you can look at legitimately without hope. He is here today. He is present and he wants to take it. He took the worst thing that could happen to a couple on their wedding day and he took it into the best thing. He turned it into the best thing. I mean, we are still talking about this wedding 2,000 years later. That is every bride's dream. Like he takes the worst and he turns it into the best. And as we obey him, he takes what we have and he makes it greater and that produces joy. And I think there's one area uh, that this, pas- this passage speaks into so many areas of obedience. But there's one I think it directly prompts us. And that's to think about obedience in the area of marriage and in singleness. Like our culture tends to see singleness as a problem that needs to be solved. But at the same time sees marriage as an unrealistic solution. And doesn't really offer us anything else that works. But Jesus tells us in his word. That, that marriage is something blessed by him, but also that being unmarried is something that is blessed by him. He tells us that sexual intimacy, its right place, is within marriage. And what that means is that we can expect God to bless our sexual intimacy within marriage, but it also means we can expect him to bless our celibacy outside of marriage. Uh, this was one of the great ironies of the sexual revolution, that it ended up statistically with less people, uh, with most people having less sex and re- rating it as less satisfying. Why? Because the foundation of a healthy sex life is trust. And the foundation of romance is exclusivity. And the greatest expression of those is found in the marriage vows. Jesus wants to bless us in our marriage. We should be expecting God to bless our marriages and the marriages of our friends. And we should position ourselves, if you are married, for God to bless your marriage. But if you're unmarried, as Jesus did, to be a blessing to those who are married. One of the ways that Kate and I do it is we go on the marriage course. You'll have seen uh, the pre-marriage and the marriage course both start next month. We tend to do it every three years. And it's a great way to invest in your relationship. To say, Jesus, we've got this marriage. We've got our water. Come and turn it into wine. And in our experience, that is what he does. Jesus is the greatest champion of marriage. And he saves this marriage on this day. But he's also the greatest champion of being unmarried. Jesus lived the most fulfilled life that has ever been seen, and he was not married. It's been said that marriage reveals the shape of the gospel, but singleness reveals its sufficiency, the sufficiency of God's love. And actually, probably singleness is the wrong word, because what you see, Jesus is always around people. He has these amazing friendships. It's even been said that the greatest miracle of Jesus' ministry was a man having 12 friends in his 30s. Like, he's always got people around him. He's building great friendships between men and women. And he can model that for us as well. In both ways of life, Jesus asks us to be obedient. And as we offer him our water, he turns it into wine. Jesus always takes our life and he seeks to make it better. And it produces joy. But the last thing that I think we see in Mary's command to do whatever he tells you is she makes it really simple because she lands it in you. It can be so easy to be distracted by other people's obedience or other people's disobedience or our own failures and all that, but she just says, no, 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 it's just about you. Do whatever he tells you. And the thing is, this makes it simple because the end goal of obedience isn't obedience. The end goal of obedience is a relationship. And that's why it's about you. That's why we don't have to always be caught up in what others are doing. Because obedience gives us a ringside seat to the faithfulness of our Father in heaven. It is a way of seeing who he is. See, the servants, they take the water that's been turned into wine, and they take it to their boss, hoping that Jesus is true to his word. And we read, he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Isn't that amazing? The only people to witness the first miracle of Jesus are the servants. The servants. And I think there are two reasons that Jesus does this. The first reason is a practical one because rule one of every wedding is you do not pull focus. It does not matter if you are the son of God, pull focus, the bride will not be happy with you. Uh, But the second reason is because 
He wants to make himself known to us. He wants to reveal his glory, as it said in verse 11. And he does so by showing us what he's like. As we're obedient, we see his character. It's a bit like, I, confession, I used to uh, like, enjoy quite teasing my mum about her IT and computer skills. And uh, it was quite a source of, source of joy for me. But one day she just came back at me with this amazing retort. She said, don't mock me that I can't open my emails I had to teach you to use a spoon. <laughs> Which is, a, that's like a, a brilliant retort, isn't it? I, I think she's, she read it on Pinterest. Mums love Pinterest. And, um, and I kind of understood that. But now that we've got kids, I really get that. Like, uh, like if, if I feed my kids, like, it's a lot more efficient. But if I let them have a go, as you'll see in this photo, it's a lot more joyful. It's a lot more joyful. Like, there's more food on the back of their heads than there is in their tummy. But it's joyful. And I love the fact that I put them in the chair. I give them the spoon. I prepare the food. They shovel 2% in. And then look pleased with themselves. But it gives me so much joy. And then they get joy joy as they see me delighting in them and it's the same with our father in heaven he says look look, I'll do what I can do come and join me and do what you can do as you do that you get a ringside seat to see the faithfulness of God Jesus did not need to include the servants in this miracle but as he gives them a spoon he gives them a front row seat to see what he's like they see that he's humble they see that he's compassionate they see that he's generous but what else do they see they see this at the end the master of the banquet says to the groom everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine that was like a tactic you bring out the expensive stuff everyone thinks oh you've gone for Hendrix and not like I don't know Tesco zone. Uh, and then once they've had a bit and they can't taste the difference, you then bring the Tesco zone in the Hendrix bottle. That's basically the thing, like, it's kind of a saving face. But he says, look, that's what everyone else does, but you have saved the best till now. What do the servants see? What they see is amazing. They see a groom who's totally unworthy. He had one job, plan the wedding, provide the wine, and he got it wrong. He had one job and he didn't do it. And then he's not involved in fixing it. And as far as we're aware, he's not even aware that anything is wrong. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. He does nothing. The only thing he does is receive credit for their work and Jesus' miracle. Jesus sees the shame. He sees the shame of the groom who's done something wrong. He sees the shame of the bride who's been wronged and been let down by her groom. He sees the shame of the family as they're going to be associated with this failure. And he covers it all. Shamelessness is a gift of the gospel. Jesus sees the shame and he covers it. And this groom who deserved shame, instead he gets praise. The praise Jesus deserved. And as the servants watched that, as they thought about it, what I think they realized is, I am that undeserving groom. I'm the groom who deserves nothing and gets everything. And not only that, I get the praise that Jesus deserved. And it's a window into the cross that we get what he deserved and he gives us what he rightly deserved and our shame is covered. And instead, it's not, it's not just shame is neutralized, it's replaced with joy. The greater miracle is not that he takes water and turns it into wine, but that he takes our sin and he turns it into friendship. And he takes our shame and he turns it into joy. And the amazing thing is, Jesus didn't wait for the groom to be worthy. Jesus didn't love the future groom. He loved the now groom. Jesus doesn't love the future you. He loves the now you. He doesn't want to bless the future you. He wants to bless the now you because he has saved the best till now. And what that means is that now is the best moment to put your trust in Jesus. Now is the best time to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And now is the best time to lean into the Father's love and discover the joy of being obedient. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand?